Hello, I'm Ann Bocock, and welcome to Between the Covers, mm -hmm. presented by WXEL Television and Murder on the Beach Mystery Bookstore in Delray Beach. My guest has written so many books that I think I have lost count. He's best known for, I believe, the 19 books in the Doc Ford series, although in my opinion, the Hannah Smith series is every bit as compelling. He's an award-winning and New York Times best-selling author. And what a story about his personal life, how being a fishing guide uh, becomes a best-selling author. He has been known as one of the hottest writers in America, and I'm very pleased to welcome Randy Wayne White. Great to be here. <laughs> well, Great looking group. My golly, if we could bottle these genetics, we'd be billionaires. Billionaires. <laughs> and you look great this morning, Anne, thank as well. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank <laughs> you for joining us on this coast of Florida. Your home is on the West Coast, is, which yeah. we sort of consider here the kinder, gentler part of Florida. Well, I probably shouldn't say anything about that, although we're kinder and gentler. Oh, wait, you just said that. Uh, <laughs> we call it the Mangrove Coast. It's the Back Bay Coast. It's... It's more uh, Midwestern, I would think, to some degree, more Southern in other ways. And, uh, but both coasts are lovely, of course. Very diplomatic. You know what surprised me? Your books are fiction, but they are so full of the richness of Florida history. I was surprised to find out that you're not a native. No, I'm not. I was born in Ohio, and I'm darn proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> but all my family's from North Carolina. And we're all from somewhere else, wherever we might be born, I believe. Went to high school in Iowa, um, moved to Florida in 72, and fell in love not just with the natural history, our incredible natural history, but our very compelling and, and, and incredible social history. So, A um, lot of which comes out in, in your books. Well, it's it. obvious that you do your homework when it comes to research. And I think you probably know more history than a lot of, of Florida natives. I assume it's important to you to get it right because you'd be getting the fan mail otherwise. Well, you know what? I've, I discovered something early on, and it's this. And I suspect many people here are, are writers, those of you who are not homeless. If you're readers, <laughs> I believe you are therefore writers. I truly believe that. But I learned this early on. If a reader catches you in an error of fact, whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction, you've lost much of your credibility. So I take the research very seriously, and I wish I remembered everything <laughs> I had researched or written. Uh, my memory's not that great, but, but yeah, I do take it very seriously. And it's fascinating, the state we live in. The books are set in Florida. Mm -hmm. They're not set in the, the same Florida like a lot of mystery writers. We're not talking the South Beach, the Disney. It's a different Florida. Well, uh, Florida's a different state. It's eclectic and, and, and varied. And if you're writing about two characters and the setting is Florida, you're necessarily dealing with at least one very powerful character, and that is Florida. Um, and, and much of the reason I love the state. The west coast of Florida, um, Sanibel Island, where I live, lovely, lovely place, is much, much different than Chukaloski, Florida, which is about 65 miles to the south, much different. Um, Sarasota is different than Cape Coral. It's, uh, I call Cape Coral uh, Steubenville by the sea, I think I called it <laughs> once. <laughs> but all, there, all these places are very different. But, uh, How did you end up as a fishing guide, which is where this whole story began? Right, yeah. Uh, I was a light tackle fishing guide on uh, Tarpon Bay, Sanibel Island, Florida, for more than 13 years. I did more than 3,000 charters. <laughs> With mm -hmm. rare exception, I was in the water about 300 days a year or more. The marina closed to powerboat traffic, or the Tarpon Bay was closed to powerboat traffic in 1987, and I'm not qualified to do anything. So I wrote a book. And by, <laughs> by gum, it's worked out swell. That, that is definitely the Cliff Notes version, but you had been writing under an alias. I, I wrote a number of thrillers under pen names. I also worked, I worked very hard at learning this, this difficult craft of writing. Uh, I would get up an hour or two earlier, and for a fishing guide, that's early. Or I'd stay up later, and started publishing in some major magazines. Um, Rolling Stone uh, founded Outside Magazine in, I think, 1978, publi published with them. 
uh, Men's Journal, National Geographic Traveler, Playboy. We did a number of stories for Playboy, so I worked very hard on it. Yeah. You're known for your characters, particularly Doc Ford. Yeah. In that way, as I said, night was I correct with with nineteen in the Doc Ford series? Actually, there are twenty one Doc Ford 21, novels okay. published, and I'm working on the twenty second. Uh, I was actually just in that little room there. <laughs> it's called Cuba Straits. We but. just stopped you as you as you were as you were typing. Yeah, yeah. Doc Ford is is one character, and Tomlinson in those books, the the other, very interesting character. Two sides of Doc Ford. You have this government, former government operative, if I said that mm, correctly, yeah, yeah. and marine biologist in one guy. And I think most of us probably have two sides, but you managed to paint this very well. Well, I, you, you nailed something, not just in the Doc, Doc Ford novels, but I think in all of us, as writers, as readers. Uh, the polarity uh, in my novels. Doc Ford, the marine biologist, is He's very linear, pragmatic, and he's not a spiritual guy. The other character, Tomlinson, however, is purely spiritual, empathetic, and that wistful, empathetic, uh, the wistful spiritual in me is often at odds in that linear pragmatic that is in me. So these two characters, th through them, I can say about any doggone thing I want and get away with it. It's awesome. I, I want to go back to something you just said. The action in your book, so much of it, takes place on the water, it does, yeah. a place you really know well after all of those years of being a, a fishing guide and you live on the water. Now, mm -hmm. yeah. what is it about the water? Is it somewhat spiritual for you or is it what you cannot see that lurks below that's intriguing? An interesting question. Is the water spiritual for me? Uh, I so often hear people say, I. I walk the beach and I feel at one with the sea. Well, I have never felt at one with the sea. Uh, I have felt terrified, um, um, interested, fascinated, uh, but never at one. I felt no spiritual linkage. I wish I could, I wish mm. I did. However, I know, <laughs> because I've done a lot of long, open water, long distance swimming. Every year I do the St. Pete to Tampa swim. That's about three and a half to five miles, depending on how far you go off course. <laughs> and I've been in big water alone, and, and something's going to eat you. Now, it's just a matter of time, but something is going to eat you. Now, you may well drown first, but ultimately something is going to eat you. <laughs> so That sounds terrifying. <laughs> well, it just scares the heck out of me, too. I don't know why I do these <laughs> why things. Why do you do it? I'm just nuts. <laughs> but it's not the sort of thing you're going to see in a Hallmark card, but it's it's true. It is true. Now, my character Tomlinson might well disagree. But uh, so the allure of the water, much of it is what you cannot see uh, for me. Uh, uh, much of it for me is that I, I understand so little about it. And there's so much more to know. And I, I love to figure out how things interlo interlock and link and interact. And it's fascinating. Do you get to spend as much time on or near the water as, as you would like to? Never. <laughs> Never, which is t tells you how nuts I am. Uh, but I love paddle boarding and paddle surfing and, and swimming in open water. Love to just head out from the beach. And I didn't know I did a swim out uh, on this book tour. I think it was very windy. It was a couple of years ago. And I swam out through the breakers. I got caught in some riptide. And kept getting further and further out, and I finally made it back in, and there was a, a gentleman there with his two children, and he watches me crawl, crawl out of the water, and he said, did you fall off a boat? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I might as well have. <laughs> did you do what you were supposed to do with the riptide and swim parallel to the coast? Yeah, yeah you, just, you, you stay calm, and you just try to swim parallel, but you, <laughs> keep in mind that as you're trying to swim parallel, you can also be swept out, and that's when you do not panic. You just stick with it. And, you're going to end up somewhere. Okay. If something doesn't eat you. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, now for the new novel, which is Haunted, yeah. Haunted and that is the Hannah Smith series. This, I, I think I am correct, this is the third Pizza, in the yeah. Hannah Smith yeah, series. Yeah. It is just as action packed as the Doc Ford novels with the, the twists and the turns that, that we expect from you. And I love the idea that she does fishing expeditions as well as her private eye work. 
Yeah, I love Hannah Smith. I just adore Hannah Smith. Um, in Florida history, there were uh, there are two iconic. There are many iconic women. Two of whom are the Smith sisters. Late 1800s, early 1900s, Hannah Smith and Sarah Smith. Sarah Smith, Hannah's sister, was the first human being, not just the first woman, the first human being to ever drive an ox cart across the Everglades. Have you ever tried to walk in the Everglades? This is, this is an incredible feat. She was called the Ox Woman. And as my Hannah Smith frets, uh, she, she hopes it's not because of the one photograph taken of Sarah Smith. Uh, Hannah Smith, the first Hannah Smith, the real Hannah Smith, was known as Big Six because she was tall and she chopped wood for a living. And she, she uh, hunted hogs and helped drive cattle. Well, I love that, that female, independent, particularly Southern voice. My maternal family is from Richmond County, North Carolina, a cotton mill town. And I grew up my dear departed mother, Georgia, nay, Wilson, and my six aunts or aunts, listening to them on the porch on summer nights. And none of these women had gone beyond the eighth grade, but they loved books. So they're very well educated and very smart. And they were and are the funniest human beings I've ever met. But to listen to them interact and observe and tell ghost stories, well, that's the voice I try to capture in my Hannah Smith. And it's, it's a hoot. I want to thank you for inventing this particular woman. She is wonderful. As I said, she is a fishing guide, and she's very tall, and she has oh. these, these body images that, uh, she, uh, I love that, because you, you kind of, you really targeted how women think about themselves. Well, I don't know. I, I certainly try, and there, there are many flippant answers to that, and I'll not give them, but uh, no, I, I try very hard, but I think, all the jokes about men and women aside, <clears throat> we are cerebrally very, very much alike. We are. And our gender, our sex is really not determined until like, apparently just slightly after we're born, really. So we are all made up of the, essentially the same components. Um, in my book, Haunted, Hannah Smith, she's a fishing guide. Well, uh, when I was a fishing guide, I taught fly casting and I taught a lot of people to fish, and here's what I learned very quickly. Women learn much faster than men, particularly fly casting, because one, they actually listen to you, <laughs> and two, they don't try to overpower the rod. In fly casting, it's more of a, it's more like this, as opposed to boom, boom. And women learn that very quickly, and so it's, it seemed perfectly natural to have Hannah Smith as a fishing guide. You write the book as a woman. Was it a challenge to get that into your head? No, no, no. I have a feminine side. Fortunately, it's on my back, but uh, <laughs> that's the flippant answer. <laughs> but uh, my editor, Neil Nyron at Putnam's, and the president of Penguin Putnam, Ivan Held, they, they vested a lot of confidence in allowing me to try to do this. And, and uh, people really like Hannah Smith, as do I. She is likable. She is definitely likable. She was an ugly duckling, uh, caught up late with her body, and has this family past of Hannah Smith, Big Six, and Sarah Smith, the ox woman, uh, who were not particularly attractive women, and who, both of whom, ran afoul of men. This is true. Uh, the real Hannah Smith in the early 1900s uh, met a fellow in the 10,000 Islands by the name of Ed Watson who was known as huh? Bloody Ed Watson. Huh. Ed Watson almost certainly murdered Belle Starr. Th this is true. And Hannah Smith, the real Hannah Smith, was found, she'd been murdered. She was found on Chatham River floating, and she'd been murdered. So my Hannah Smith is well aware that the women in her family don't always have the best judgment when it comes to men. And as a result, she's very careful. And she's not a prude. But she does not like profanity, so uh, you know she tells people when they use the GD word, you know, she's a believer, and she doesn't like that, and she tells them. Uh, she is an independent, free-thinking, occasionally outspoken woman. And man, I like that. The book is haunted, and my guest is Randy Wayne White. 
And within this story, there is perhaps a haunted house, but certainly an historic house. And it's slated to be demolished to make way for, of course, condos. Mm -hmm. Is this perhaps commentary on what we have done in Florida? No, no, but that's a good question. But uh, no, it has more to do, uh, a, a very brief backstory. I wrote a novel called The Man Who Invented Florida. And it's one of my favorite books. It's slow and strange and you'll fall asleep if you try to read it. But it is about, it's about the state taking over, displacing people in the Everglades and kicking them out of their homes. Well, the reviewers all, with no exceptions, all said it's about condo developers kicking people out. It's, that, it's become such a cliche, we don't even think about the plot line. So no, that's not the case in this book. It has much to do with the Civil War, Florida during the Civil War. Very little has been written about that. I was surprised at a lot of th things I never heard of. It's, it's really interesting, isn't it? Yes. Um, and I accessed uh, old journals from that time period and other, and other sources. And um, I was unaware that Florida, during the Civil War, suffered a terrible salt famine. Were you aware? Well, salt, my golly, you can go to Burger King, get all the salt you want. Salt's bad for us. We shouldn't eat salt, da 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 Well, in 1861, 1865, there was no refrigeration. And if they had no salt, they couldn't preserve their fish, their pork, their beef. They had no meat. There was a salt famine because the Union forces came down both coasts and destroyed the salt pans and the salt works. And so that begat um, these kind of what I call the salt wars in Florida and the cow wars, the cattle war. And I love that history in terms of that house. You know, I, I live in the oldest house in my county. Uh, it's built atop the remnants of a shell pyramid built by contemporaries the Maya, uh, where archaeologists have found human burials on my property. If there is a haunted house in Florida, it should it's be yours. my house. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it should be my house. And I do like ghost stories, and I, I like the idea that people believe there are ghosts such a, and that sort of thing. And it's fun to tie in. But in haunted, there are two things far more terrifying than ghosts. Um, Florida has an incredible interaction in history with circuses and carnivals. It dates back to the 1800s. Ringling Brothers, Clyde Beatty Cole right. Brothers, many carnivals. With the carnivals, with the circuses, came exotic animals, lions, tigers, bears, oh my. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I remember running up uh, the Mayaka River and seeing a gentleman hosing an elephant as if he was washing an SUV. Now, this is near <laughs> Gibsonton, where the carnival people right. have wintered for more than 100 years. So Hannah runs amok. She runs afoul of two of these circus animals, and they're adult chimpanzees. We know that horrific story, the poor woman, oh, I yes. think, in Connecticut, who ran into an adult chimp, and it took her face off. And I did a lot of research about how chimpanzees, primates, respond to human primates when they attack. A, a gentleman named Dr. Josh Sheridan did a very learned paper on that. And basically it comes down to this. If a female, adult female chimp attacks a woman, she's going to make you unappealing to the opposite sex, I'll put it that way. If an adult male chimp attacks a human male, he is going to eliminate us of any chance of reproducing, I'll put it that way. And that's the first thing they do. So these two chimps, one of which is female, goes after Hannah through the Everglades. And wow, it's scary. Yes, it is. <laughs> but it's not gross yes, or grabby. Yes, it is. <laughs> you know, you yourself do not have to go too far to find a storyline in anything because you've done some really crazy things. Oh, just not. And you have been in very interesting situations. You have been stabbed. Yeah, you have been so. shot at. Yeah, yeah. You were in a hotel, I believe it is Peru, that Got managed to blow up. Juan Cayo, Peru, um, yeah. What happened? I think they, I think they were drunk, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was in uh, Juan Cayo, Peru, up in the Andes, and it was attacked by a, um, a so-called revolutionary group, and they were just a bunch of thugs, actually, called Sendero Luminoso, Chinese Maoists. And, uh, 56 people were killed that night, very tough oh. place. And 
I was in Nicaragua many times during the, the unpleasantness there and, and uh, spent much of my life doing that sort of thing. Fair to say you are an adventure junkie? Uh, not now. I like to paddle and surf and swim. <laughs> but, uh, tired of being shot at? Is that it? I'm tired of airports, man. Oh, well, yeah. But your life makes your fiction heroes kind of look like slackers sometimes because oh, no, you have not. done a lot. <laughs> we're not slackers, but uh, it's much to write about. Unusual, interesting lives we live, don't we? I understand you used your boat one to bring Cuban refugees. Uh, I didn't use my boat. I borrowed a 55-foot grouper a boat in 1980, uh, went to Mary Island Harbor for a Cuban-American friend of mine in the hopes of bringing back his aunt and his grandmother. Imagine this. You and your husband have a son and a daughter. On January, or December 31st, 1958, your husband and your son fly from Havana to Miami. The next day, you and your daughter are supposed to come. Fidel Castro closed the airports. That family was separated for 22 years. Mm. So yeah, I went to Mariel to, in the hopes of getting my friend's grandmother and aunt. Returned from Mariel with 147 refugees mm. on a 55-foot boat. How many people would normally be on a 55-foot boat? 12 would be pushing it, okay. um, 12 would be pushing it. Stormed all night, every one of those folks were sick, but when they raised Key West, when they realized what they were seeing, they all took up this chant, Libertad, Libertad, Liberty. It was very powerful, and it really stuck with me, and I, I still go to Cuba quite often. You did a PBS documentary, I believe, in, in Cuba that had to do with baseball, giving the, baseball equipment right, to? Right, yeah, the, the gift of the game. My friend Bill Spaceman Lee pitched for the Red Sox for many years, uh, John Warden pitched for Detroit and some other buddies. We, over the years, came up with this habit, actually, of, of buying baseball equipment, taking it to Cuba, running a car or a bus, and just driving around. And when we'd see kids playing ball, we'd stop, get out, play baseball, give them the stuff, never tell them who we were, and just... But yeah, and WGBH Boston was the host station. And it's very sweet and funny and, uh, and true. You'll, you'll like it. The gift of the game. The, the gift of the game. The only PBS station, I think, in the nation that has not shown it is the Southwest Florida PBS station. And here's why. The woman who was in charge didn't like it that we wore Hooters uniforms. This is PBS, public. So it's public as long as you match whomever that person's ideal of is of, of behavior. But you would like the documentary very much. Well, that was the sweet story. Now I have to ask you something else mm -hmm. about a friend of yours, Tim Dorsey, who, who? <laughs> as you all know, Tim Dorsey is another sort of well-known South Florida He's terrific writer. terrific yeah. writer. Um, what's the feud? Oh, we have no feud. I think the world of Tim Dorsey. Carl Hyacinth's a great friend. We've been friends forever. But you made him a mass murderer, was that it, or a, no, a Tim, serial killer? No, Tim or? makes up these wild <laughs> stories. I don't, he came to my house one time. I was playing catch with Bill Lee, pitch for the Red Sox. Tim gets out, and he goes, and Tim's a huge Red Sox fan. He goes, do you know who that is? I went, yeah, it's Bill. <laughs> it's my buddy Bill. So Tim plays catch with Bill. Tim pulls a groin muscle playing catch. Now, that's hard to do. Uh, and anyway, so I'm not going to go into it, but no, I adore Tim, but he makes up the stuff that we have a feud. And I did, I will admit, that at, at a certain bookstore, I did write on the bathroom wall <laughs> for a mediocre time called Tim Dorsey. Okay. <laughs> and, and I put a cell phone number. But that's just good fun. <laughs> Do you write every day? Seven days a week, with rare exception, except on the book tour, yes, yeah. It's just, it's what I do, and uh, I'm brilliant when it comes to making excuses, and I try not to fall for my own excuses. Because I assume your editor wants the next book coming out as soon as the you know, first mm -hmm. one is released. Yeah, yeah. This one is Haunted. It is the third in the Hannah Smith series. It, it's a really good read as well. You're going to learn a lot about Civil War in Florida. I knew nothing about this. This was totally... I'm totally so surprising, and she's such a great character. Yeah, I want to thank, thank you, you so for her. much. I, she, I much she is delightful. I assume you've already started the next one with her. No, no, I'm working on the 22nd Doc Ford novel, Cuba Straits, and if I put, when that's published, if they still allow me in Cuba, I'll be very surprised. Really, you 
Okay, that, just, now I'm we'll, intrigued. Let's leave it there. <laughs> okay, Cuba Straits is 23. It's a 22nd Doc Ford novel, and then I'll do, I'm doing at least two more Hannah Smith novels and more Doc Ford novels. So no time off for you? I'm, I live in a magic, magic life, and uh, I'm, I'm happy doing what I'm doing. Yeah. Well, we're happy you're doing it. Oh, Th thanks, thank you. Thank you. I'm Ann Bocock, and you've been watching Between the Covers. My guest has been Wandy, Randy Wayne White. I can't say it either. Well, I'm telling <laughs> Wandy you. Randy Rain Wright. Wandy you know, Rain Wright. We have to do something about this. The, the, the Hannah Smith novel is haunted, and you'll have to be leaving us and going back to the other coast. Nope, I've got to, more book, book signings to do. Look forward to that. And you'll be in, in Sanibel. Yeah, I love Santa Monica. Be at the restaurant, Doc Ford's, rum bars and grills. And yeah, it's awesome. So, thank you so much for being a guest thank on Between you, the Covers. Wonderful job, thank you. And thank you to Murder on the Beach Mystery Bookstore in Delray Beach. I'm Ann Bocock. Thank you all for joining us. Good job. Very good job.